if I left the interview with any kind of part of me feeling unsure, I just thought, gosh, if they can't sell themselves, which mm-hmm. is the product they know best, why am I so confident that they can sell my product? Welcome to the Full Funnel Freedom Podcast. If you are listening to this, you are likely leading a team responsible for generating revenue. Purpose of Full Funnel Freedom is to support people like yourself and keep your funnels consistently, reliably full. Welcome to the Full Funnel Freedom Podcast. I'm your host, Hamish Knox. Today, I am delighted to have Karen Gordon as my guest today. Karen is a go-to-market leader who has spent her career building and scaling early and growth stage startups. Most recently, she was the executive vice president and a founding team member at Good Shuffle Pro, a SaaS platform for event companies, where she built the company from $0 to over $5 million in annual recurring revenue, which led them to their Series A funding in January 2024. She is currently working as a consultant and advisor to businesses looking to scale growth and can be found at innofig.com. Karen, welcome to Full Funnel Freedom. Thank you so much for having me, Hamish. How's it going? It's going pretty well, thanks. I uh, really loved our connection. Uh, you know, previous guest Will uh, connected us, and uh, I, I really enjoyed our first conversation. I'm delighted that we could get together today and share some of your wonderful ideas and insights with our audience. Before we get there, though, tell us your story. I've given the audience the thirty thousand foot view. Tell us about how you, where you started, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Well, I, like most people, did not graduate with a sales degree, um, but found myself in sales right after school. Um, And I, you know, so I've been a revenue generator my whole career, um, but I left that role. Uh, I think at the time I would have told you that I was never going to work in sales again and never going to work in tech again. Uh, Turns out both of those were very wrong. Um, (laughs) But then pretty soon after early in my career, I had the awesome opportunity of being part of a team that really launched and scaled a whole business. It was sort of a business within a business at Living Mm. Social. And I very quickly got bit by the startup bug um, and just loved the opportunity to see very high impact, um, Mm -hmm. work with really smart people, um, and then continue chasing that and have worked at across several different industries as a revenue leader, um, scaling across more marketing and sales heavy jobs, as well as uh, working as a kind of GM position and director of product. Um, And then, yeah, the last seven and a half years I spent growing a uh, SaaS platform, Good Shuffle Pro, and I'm really proud of the team I built there and um, and now kind of entering a new chapter as I'm consulting and, and advising for several different companies, getting to really see, um, again, opening my eyes back up to multiple industries after having worked uh, in one for, for almost a decade. Wow, what a, cool, what a cool journey you've been on, and I look forward to unpacking that a little bit more. Specifically, something that you had shared with me in our previous conversation is about the different uh, flavors, for lack of a better term, of, of, of sales leaders, of revenue leaders that you can experience in, in startups. And of, on one end, you have someone with zero who you know kind of got dropped into the role. And then you have the other extreme of someone who's very experienced, but the experience can come in in different ways. So for the audience, what, what does that look like from your experience of the different styles of sales leaders that you get into a startup? Yeah, so I think there's a few different things to think about when you want some sales leadership in your company. There is one, which is making sure you really know the type of sale you need, right? There's this, there's all different styles and methodologies for sales. And it's really important that people understand that that's going to vary depending on if you're B2B, B2C, if you're selling to SMB or enterprise that Mm -hmm. not all sales are created equal. And then I think that also a lot of times folks sort of shortcut and assume it depends on the stage that you're in. And I think that's largely true. I I definitely think there's a difference between, you know, a zero to 10 leader and a 10 to 20 and whatnot. Um, But I think more important is to think about the why with that, because sometimes it's not as simple as where you are. Mm -hmm. Meaning, do you know for sure that you have your unique value proposition nailed down? Do you Mm -hmm. have your buyer personas nailed down? Um, Do you need someone to come in and be wonderful at just, you know, managing and growing the sales team? Do you need somebody who's going to be able to create the sales emails? Do you need someone who's going to, who's worked with marketing and has that sort of full, uh, 
customer journey map in their head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just all these different things that a sales leader doesn't necessarily always do. And again, oftentimes it is closely related to how early of a stage, because early stage you're expected to do more. But yeah. also sometimes later on, you've pivoted a few times, you may have a certain amount of revenue coming in, but if you're not confident that you have your messaging clear, you, you're not mm. confident that your pricing strategy is correct, then you wanna make sure that you're considering that in your sales leader because you may have sales leadership who's coming and is used to taking a baton and just running with it. But like, <laughs> if you're not sure if it's the right one, you sure. might want to evaluate that first. That's fair because ultimately what I've experienced with founders, especially very technical founders, is they just hope sales happens. And the first person who comes in who goes, I can sell stuff and I can scale a team. They're like, awesome, go do that. And usually that doesn't work out very well. Um, occasionally, blind squirrel finds a nut, but you know, often that doesn't work out. So it, from your experience, because you literally were a starting day zero founder for the last seven and a half years, as you've shared with us, what sort of experience did you bring to that founding team that was beneficial to go from zero dollars to five million ARR and now set up for success to scale past your past your time with the company? Yeah, I mean, it worked out very well for some technical co-founders that I started with because I had worn these different hats. So I had not only been a sales leader, I had also worked very much, you know, very closely with marketing. I had worked on marketing initiatives and built them myself. I had worked as basically a GM of a product, um, doing everything, you know, owning the whole P&L. So I had really worn all of these hats on the business side and was able to really carry all, all of the business teams and be all of the business teams <laughs> and then slowly build out each of them beneath me. Um, and that's, you know, to find that kind of level of a, of a Swiss army knife is, is different than what you're normally looking for in a sales leader. Um, but I've seen it, you know, even now as I'm working with different companies, some of them feel like they're, to your point, really just ready to say, okay, just have someone run and sell. And if you don't know what that means, you need to make sure that you're asking questions about what are you saying and why are you saying it? Mm -hmm. How are you getting that traction and why are you going that route? Why are you using that channel? Is it mm -hmm. because that's just what they've done in the past, that they are better at in-person sales versus virtual, for example? Or is it because they're better at call scripts than email? Or is it because they deeply understand your, e your actual audience and your product mm -hmm. and can give you a really valid reason. I mean, I always think of like Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. Like, mm -hmm. what is your why? And a company should, of course, ask themselves that, but you should be also asking sales leaders that. Can they tell you why a specific method or a specific pitch is really going to, to be what does it? I love that you shared that because I was, as you were sharing, uh, my, my thought was, okay, so for these technical founders who are not necessarily people oriented, right? They they're they're wonderful human beings. They they're just not. They want to work on the on the product. Great. Um, how do they identify like red flags, yellow flags in someone who is positioning themselves to be this this wonderful sales leader? So you just gave us one about the why. From your experience, what are two or three other red flags and maybe some yellow flags that a, a founder would want to look out for when they are bringing on a, a sales leader candidate to scale their business? Well, first of all, I do feel like I have to make the plug that I happened to work with two technical co-founders who are very people-oriented, um, so they don't necessarily fit the normal mode. I <laughs> want to make sure I give them proper proper shout-outs and accolades. Um, very but fair. yes, absolutely. I mean, even if you are extremely people-oriented, it's always the hardest to hire outside of yeah. your expertise, for sure. And I think that salespeople, it can be tricky because if they're at all decent at sales, they already have a leg up on selling you, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that is actually one of the simple things that, uh, what was I listening to or reading recently, where it was just so simply put, but I had been laughing because I had been interviewing someone right before I listened to something where they very simply said, if you're not sold, and that was something I kind of came back to oftentimes when I was hiring you know, senior leaders or even frontline salespeople is, if I left the interview with any kind of part of me feeling unsure, I just thought, gosh, if they can't sell themselves, which mm -hmm. is the product they know best, why am I so confident that they can sell my product? 
Um, the other thing is, are they selling you your product? The number of times that I have had people come in, again, for senior leadership positions and incorrectly explain our product. Right. It, it, you know, how, like, you're not doing the research that is needed that you should be doing before each sale anyway. So it sounds like very simple advice, but you would be shocked how often people forget to stop with those basics. Can they sell themselves? Can they sell your product? That's step one and step two. And then from there, I would really not be shy to ask specifics and tactics. You know, as sales leaders, we're taught to speak about our impact. So mm -hmm. it's very, you know, natural for me to go in and say, I took this company from this to this. I did this mm -hmm. and this and this. I did this with this impact. Ask people how, how did you do that? And you'll start hearing, well, our team did that. What did you do? Yeah. What did you specifically do? And how did you come up with that? And if they say, well, I am constantly reading things and I read something that, or I have a big network and one of my f founder friends gave me this idea. Like that's the type of person you wanna hire because they mm -hmm. are curious, they are constantly learning, they will check their ideas, they will, you know, they're growing. If somebody just, yeah, they may have some cool resume bullet point, but if it's because someone else on their team was smart and they've kind of rode that wave, <laughs> then that's not, <laughs> that's a problem, right? So I think yeah. it's that, that final, it's making sure they can sell themselves the product and then making sure they can explain how and why. Brilliant. Uh, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me the first bit about like, it's either hell yeah or no. Mm -hmm. And and if, and if you're not feeling, that's what I was hearing from you is, if you're not saying, hell yeah, this is the right sales leader candidate, move on. And then the other part of it is that, that how, and I know I've coached plenty of founders where they bring in a sales leader who had great success at giant company, et cetera, et cetera. And then you found out it was because they had a team. And as soon as they get in the startup environment, all of a sudden everything falls apart because they're used to having three assistants do everything for them. And they don't even know how to log into the CRM, much less enter anything that is gonna be worth something. So listeners, go back and, and rewind, listen to what Karen said about hiring a sales leader several times over because it was absolutely brilliant. So thank you for that, Karen. The next thing I'm curious about is your experience as a founder and as a sales leader from, from day zero. Because uh, I'm in Calgary and we have this giant rodeo every year called the Stampede. I'm going to use a, a rodeo reference. How do you ride that buck and bronco? Because day zero, is, it's not like everybody's going, thank God you showed up. Here's my money. Tell us about yes. that experience. That does take a lot of uh, grit. If you've ever read the book Grit by Angela Duckworth, yeah. that's another book I'll plug. Um, I love that book. I think that that is, it's tough. It's tough to be, especially when you don't have a name to back yourself up. And I think mm -hmm. that comes back to, I think people throw around the word strategy a lot these days. <laughs> um, but to me, the strategy is kind of connected to that why component. So for example, okay. I was just working with a client of mine who they've gotten a lot of early traction from doing events. And they talked about how they, their audience really likes that personal connection from events and how they're gonna keep growing with events. And I said to them, you know, I'm, I think that is really working for you now. And it's possible that that will always be part of the fabric of your marketing and your growth strategy. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage you to recognize why that makes sense now and why that might not make sense in a bit, right? That that's not awesome. necessarily the most scalable thing. But events and in-person uh, connection is a wonderful opportunity when you are new. Nobody knows your name because you mm -hmm. have to build trust somehow. Sure. And what I said to them was, look, I have faith that you are on your way to building a level of brand trust where you may not always need to do the laborious events that you're doing <laughs> currently. Um, so I think, you know, strategy meaning thinking about that why, thinking about what makes sense now. Another thing I say a lot is the hardest part is you have to both be thinking about what makes sense now and what mm. makes sense long term. Mm. And people tend to over index to one or the other. So for example, they get really caught in the weeds of now. So like that client I just mentioned, maybe just thinking it's always going to be about this one, you know, traction avenue. Mm. Uh, or they get 
really, really, really obsessed with what scales and they're not willing to do something that doesn't. And in the beginning, mm-hmm. you have to do things like call your clients and personally chat with them as if you just, you know, aren't running late to your fifth appointment for the day. <laughs> um, and so it's it's knowing what makes sense for now and then building the tracks for what makes sense for the actual long term and the actual scaling model. I'm 100% aligned with you on that. And then I also know from experience that we just get stuck, right? We just got, we got stuff to do. How do you actually make time to do the execution now and then the thinking about the future and, and starting to put those building blocks in place? Because theoretically, all of our listeners are nodding right now. And in practice, they're like, that sounds great. I've got, I got stuff on my calendar. So how do you coach your clients to actually make the time to do both so they're not over-indexed? It's radical prioritization. And I think that one of the best ways to do that is to ask yourself difficult questions such as, what are the things I like to do the most? And am I over-indexing on those? What are the (laughs) things I hate to do the most? And am I under-indexing on those? Because when we ask what's the most important, everything's important. And of course, there's other ways for you to sit and look at what's important. I like questions like, what is the one thing that I could do that would have the impact for the rest of the week or beyond? What is the one thing I could not do that wouldn't impact even the rest of my week? Things Mm. like that can help with the level of importance. But I often find that where we get stuck is being humans. It's quite the curse. (laughs) And asking things like, what am I getting a little too married to because I just like it or because I feel like I get it or I'm the best at it. Mm -hmm. And particularly small business owners, you know, they will admit that, yeah, like they probably got into their business because they're really great at certain things and the things that they don't love they're kicking the can down the road and then they have to stop and say, are any of those really important? And oftentimes Mm -hmm. they'll know. Um, But once you shed the light on why they're not doing it, Mm -hmm. then they can be more honest as to whether or not it needs to get done. Yeah. It's a, it, it makes me think of like, for, again, from my own experience as business owner, and I'm sure you have similar experience as a founder is until you, while you're in it, you don't recognize you're in it. And sometimes you need that third party to be like, Hey, Emperor, you have no clothes. Like just so just FYI, like I know you think you look awesome and maybe not so much. So how how can we trap ourselves almost because we are human, unfortunately, and fortunately, into actually being at answering those tough questions? Because I can ask that, what do I not like to do all day long or what do I like to do? And I'm gonna give me myself answers that make me feel good, and then I'm just gonna keep going down the same path. How do we make sure that we pull our head up? So we don't get stuck on that same path forever. I mean, like the cheeky answer would be hire a consultant or advisor to help you. Um, Outside of that, though, I mean, listening to podcasts would be my second cheeky answer. Um, And and reading books and things, right? You know, if you're in your own head, you're going to have your own bias. And you may know best. And I think a lot of people get into business for themselves because they know best. Uh, But of course, it's like anything else. If you have, whether it is an outside person or even just an outside source, I mean, Mm -hmm. um, like I said, with something else, I was listening to something and it was like a duh moment. Um, Oh, with hiring that like, I kind of knew that in my gut, but hearing someone else say, can they sell you on themselves? Why are you considering them for a sales job? It was something I was naturally doing, but hearing mm-hmm. the words somewhere else, whether that's, again, podcast, audiobook, whatever, it, it sits differently, right? Oftentimes, Amen. the things we're learning in life, in a class, in anything, it's not that it's such brand new information, but it is yeah. someone taking a bunch of information that lives somewhere in your atmosphere and synthesizing it and putting it in front of you, which is what yeah. we humans need, right? Totally. Totally. I, I've had a couple of clients, uh, usually very experienced individuals, and uh, we'd be talking about, I can't remember what it was in the, both cases, and they're like, man, I do this stuff naturally. And I'm like, awesome. I'd rather you did it intentionally, because then you actually mean to do it as opposed to it's in your comfort zone, or you're like, oh, I need to move to pull myself out of, a, out, out of a tailspin or whatever it might be. So having that third party, and yes, listeners, 
Karen and I are self, have self-interest. We would like you to hire us, right? That's fair. Like, let's just call it what it is. And you don't necessarily need to do that. You have podcasts. You have audiobooks like Karen is being is is referencing right now, right? So, but also, I would highly recommend you chat with Karen because she's awesome. So, Karen, I do think, yeah, it's it's just about getting outside of yourself. However, you want to do that and whatever fits in your budget. Yeah. As well. But I do think that most people who are doing things naturally, like you said. That is where you most. That is where I most often see people plateauing. That they are Fair. doing fine. They are growing their business, but it is not with the margins that they want. They're not Amen. hitting any sort of big, that big hockey stick that you want. And then they go, yeah. "Well, do I need to just hire a sales leader?" Which, depending on the business, may be what you need. Um, you definitely need to make sure you understand, to your point about intention, what it is you're doing well and yeah. what it is you're not doing well. Otherwise, it's throwing spaghetti at a wall. Amen. Amen. Yeah, let, let's make this success by design instead of by default. I'm completely aligned with you on that. Now, Karen, the DMV, people have opinions and, and thoughts about what the DMV looks like. I mean, I, I do. Like, you know, it's government defense. And, you know, if you're into music at all, it's Fugazi. But uh, there's lots of misconceptions about the DMV. And I learned a lot from you when we first connected about, like, all the tech talent specifically. So uh, would you share with our listeners, like, some of the common misconceptions about the DMV and, and what it actually looks like uh, to do business, and especially in the in the tech startup world there? Yeah. Well, first of all, in case people don't know, DMV, not just the place you wait for the driver's license, True. which is uh, Department of Motor Vehicles. We're talking about D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. Second of all, I feel like Dave Grohl, Foo Fighter, is a little bit more known from like the yeah. Northern Virginia part. So okay, fair. That out there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, definitely there's a misconception that it is all government. Um, one of my favorite stories to tell is in the early days of Good Shuffle Pro, I was sending out marketing emails just kind of blindly to event companies. And somebody wrote back and said, your software looks amazing, but I would never purchase from anything made in DC. And we had this little stamp on the bottom of our webs of our emails that said made it proudly made in Washington DC. Um, oh. We find a lot of the startup people in the area are really proud trying to, you know, make sure that people know that this scene exists. But this person, I guess, just really thought that there was some sort of pol that anything out of DC had a political uh, ah. leaning of some sort. And I wrote back just personally and said talk about things that don't scale i just wrote back and said you know happy if you're if you're inter if you're not interested in our software but just want to clear something up we have no political affiliation whatsoever we are mm. a software company designed for businesses exactly like yours we'd love mm. to talk to you sometime um so it is sort of bonkers to me how many people just really don't understand that there's a city here uh, and then a surrounding area. Um, there's, you know, parts of Reston, Virginia, where uh, AOL was founded. There's a, an area where Amazon just set up a new headquarters in kind of Crystal mm -hmm. City, uh, Arlington area. Um, so people don't always realize it, but there's a ton of tech talent here. Um, and I think all of that's changing, of course, too, because everything is so remote friendly now. So yeah. I don't know how many people then are leaving the area, but I think just as much you can bring people in because they maybe they follow a significant other who has the government job <laughs> and uh, then they just happen to be in the area. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, of, of really good resources here. And I think we're still coming back from that post COVID phase when it comes to networking, but I'm starting to see that when I've gone to events recently of, um, you got a whole new wave of talent in here because there's tons of universities in this area. Yes. Yeah. Very, very true. And I, I go to the, the Baltimore area specifically, but I've been down to Washington and, and, and parts of Northern Virginia, absolutely beautiful, uh, area, lots of amazing businesses that like, you know, AOL, which for some of our listeners might just be a funny thing to reference, and they don't know it was an actual company uh, that was, you know, dominated the tech scene for a while. So uh, thank you for sharing that insight with us. Uh, I, I love to learn about those areas and also bust some myths, right? Because we all have these, I told you on our first call, I had this perception of what uh, the DC, Maryland, Virginia area was like. And you're like, yeah, I can see that. And, and so thank you for sharing that with our audience today. Yeah, we're more than just a bunch of big white buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So 
Karen, uh, I, I can certainly nerd out with you all day about startups and scale ups and how do we uh, how do we make sure that we're getting the right sales leader on board. Uh, I have a few questions to wrap up for you today. The first one being, if you could go back and coach your younger self, go back as far as you like and say, hey, younger Karen, in the future, you'll have been a founder, you'll have scaled, you have all this amazing experience. You will also have a lot of scar tissue and a bunch of bumps and bruises. What would you coach younger Karen to say or do differently to get to the same place but with a little less scar tissue, maybe some fewer bumps and bruises. So much, right? If we could go back. <laughs> um, I think something that I did, I did do, but was accidentally to your point about intention. Once I started doing it intentionally, it made a big impact was take the opportunities where you will learn the most. Mm. Worry less about your title. Advocate for yourself on things like comp, but take the the jobs, the opportunities where you're going to learn a lot, whether that is because you're going to be given more responsibility, you're going to work with awesome peers or mentors. Mm -hmm. um, that has been, I mean, to your earlier question too about how to get a startup leader, because I had jobs that expected so much of me early in my mm -hmm. career and did so much, I was able to come into positions and say, no, I've actually done all of that already. And that learning opportunity is really what propelled things forward. It wasn't about getting any specific title at a certain age or, or, or the things you think are important when you're young. Yeah, of course. I, uh, great answer. I've never heard that answer from a guest yet is about take the learning opportunities. And I appreciate how you said advocate for yourself in comp because sometimes we hear take the learning opportunities and translate into that into take less money. It's not necessarily right. true. Not necessarily true. And I mean, there's a difference between taking like a slight haircut of, oh, I could go be a cog in the machine over here at this big company and make crazy amounts and then get the golden handcuffs. Or I could take a little bit less over here and I think I'd learn a ton. And that's going to mean a lot more, especially in five years. I think that that doesn't mean that you should sit and make new money. Fair, very fair. Uh, you've already shouted out a couple of books uh, already, uh, Grit being one of them, which I love. What else have you read, watched, or listened to that you would uh, encourage the sales leaders listening today to check out for their own personal and professional development? Uh, well, I am known as someone who actually someone just told me last week that they said, you have a book for everything. So I will try not to give a totally endless list, <laughs> but I will rattle off a few just because I am a big nerd about reading and read lots of business books. Uh, awesome. But I, I will also try to avoid strictly sales books since I'm sure you get tons of really great uh, suggestions there. Perfect. Um, one I wanted to mention when we talked about hiring is who the A player method great book, really helped revamp our hiring process. For leadership, I would say Multipliers is one of my favorite leadership books. Um, I mentioned Start With Why. Uh, I'll read anything by Adam Grant or Brene Brown. Those are just great, yeah. you know, both personal and professional development. Um, and then podcasts, I'm obsessed with Lenny's podcast for anyone in the, the tech space. Very cool. Thank you for sharing uh, those with us. Listeners, go check out all of those recommendations. Last question I have for you, Karen. You've given us great ideas and insight already today. Uh, what do you have as a final bit of wisdom, a closing thought, or something to plug? Floor's yours. People can reach out to me on LinkedIn. They can um, find my website, which I know you're going to drop in as well. But um, yeah, I think just people, I've been very much on the path of telling people to really find what lights them up and find what challenges them and excites them. And that kind of comes back to the learning opportunity. And um, that's really what's been most rewarding for me in my career is I'm, I'm really big on uh, impact, really enjoy finding opportunities where I can very quickly have an impact and um, encourage folks to figure out what it is that, that they're going for. And again, not focus on what the title is or the company name or if it's recognizable to just say like, what is it that gets you excited on a day to day and find that opportunity. Amazing. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for spending time with us today on the Full Funnel Freedom Podcast. Uh, I'm excited to continue connecting with you uh, online and offline as well. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Full Funnel Freedom Podcast. You can continue to support us by leaving us a review and a rating, sharing this episode with a couple of sales leaders in your network who you care about. I'd love to connect with you. I'm easy to find Hamish Knox on LinkedIn. 
Also, if you'd like a free 15-minute call with me, go to www.hamish.sandler.com forward slash how to Sandler. Until we connect on the next episode, go create full funnel freedom. Oh,